Paragraph 39A and section 24M talks about unaccrued or unquantified amounts. So first, let's just talk about an unquantified amount. Basically, an unquantified amount is an amount that cannot yet be determined. So we don't know how much it's going to be. This can be an amount which is payable or receivable. So, sometimes I call it an unaccrued amount as well. But let's look at an example just to understand what it is. So Mr. or Mr. X, X Limited sells a machine to Y Limited for 100,000. In terms of the sales agreement, if the machine is able to produce a certain amount of items in two years time, then Y Limited will have to pay an additional 50,000. So these type of arrangements are actually fairly common when there are these technical machines. So basically the idea is that X Limited sell, says to Y Limited, listen, this thing can make 100,000 units in a year, let's say. And if it does, then you owe me money. If it can't produce it, then you don't have to pay. So basically the question is, that 50,000 rands, is it going to be payable? Now, if in year one when we sell it, we don't know for a fact if it will be, that 50,000 rands is an unquantified amount. Okay, when will we know it? We'll only know it when that machine has produced the required amount of items. Or in two years' time, when the deal expires. So just so that you see how it works, the unquantified amount will discuss in two places. The income tax effect, so recoupments, capital allowances, those are all income things. I'll discuss in section 24, capital M. And the capital gain effect is discussed in paragraph 39, capital A. So let's start with the income tax effect. So when a taxpayer disposes of an asset and there's an unquantified amount, the, right, that amount is treated as if it did not accrue to the taxpayer during that year, and the amount is treated as if it accrued to the taxpayer in a year when it becomes quantifiable. So any recoupment must be calculated according to the above. So basically what it means is when you're doing a recoupment calculation for the amounts that you've not yet received, you can't take it into account until you have, until it becomes quantifiable. Right, and then it will become part of the calculation. So just section 24M so you can see. If a person during any year of assessment disposes of an asset for consideration which consists of or includes an amount which cannot be quantified, so much of that consideration as which cannot be quantified must be deemed not to have accrued to that person in that year and if it becomes quantifiable in a subsequent year, it must be deemed to have accrued to that person in that subsequent year. So they say, if you don't know about what those amounts were, only include in your calculations in future when you do know. So this is when we dispose of an asset. Section 24, M2, talks about when we buy an asset. Okay, so the same situation. If I just take you back up to this example I used. If X Limited sells the machine to Y Limited for 100000 and Y Limited will have two years before they know if they should pay the 50000 For X Limited, the seller, we don't know that 50000 is the amount received. But for Y Limited, what is their problem? They don't know how much the machine cost them. Did the machine cost them 100000 or did it cost them 150000 They'll only know that when that amount becomes quantifiable. So how do we treat capital allowances in that case? Right, so it says, where there are capital deductions allowed on an asset and there were unquantified amounts, then when that amount becomes quantified in the future, you will calculate all of the capital allowances for all of the years that, it, that you had the asset. So in this first situation, we sell the asset in the beginning of year one, and it takes two years, so in two years' time. So in two years' time, when they pay the 50000 you will calculate what was the capital gain in year one, year two, and year three. And you will claim all of that in the year when it becomes quantifiable. So here we go. So if a person during a year acquires an asset for consideration, which consists of or includes an amount which cannot be quantified, so much of that consideration as cannot be quantified must be deemed not to have been incurred in that year and... If it becomes quantifiable in a subsequent year, it must be deemed to have been incurred in that subsequent year. So they say, treat it as if you acquired it only in the year when it became quantifiable. But then, if an asset was acquired, as contemplated in subsection 2, which is this section, so they say if this is applicable, and it is a depreciable asset, so one of which you can claim capital allowances, and 
the amount is in terms of subsection 2b, so this one here, deemed to have been actually incurred in a subsequent year of assessment, which has not been taken into account in determining the amount of any allowance in respect of that depreciable asset in any previous year, and would have been so taken into account had that amount been actually incurred. So much of the amount as would have been so allowed as an allowance must be allowed in that subsequent year. So, what are they saying? They say, if there is a situation where an amount becomes quantifiable in a future year, this section over here tells us you are treated only if it was incurred then in that future year. But this section says, you need to determine if that amount had been there from the start, would we have calculated an allowance on it? So say if it has not been taken into account, would you have taken into account? If the answer is, so would it have been taken into account? If the answer is yes, then in the year when we incurred, you calculate all of the capital allowances that you should have claimed in any previous year, and you claim it in that year of assessment. Paragraph 39A then speaks about the capital loss. Right, if you have a capital loss and there's an unaccrued amount. So let me just have a quick, very simple explanation just here. Okay, so if we just have a simple example, not taking into account any recoupments or anything like that. So in year one, we sell an asset that has a base cost of 800,000, we sell it for 600,000. These amounts over here, just assume that they are unquantified until it happens. So in year two, there's 100,000 rands extra to receive, and in year three, an extra 400,000. They were unquantified. So when we are doing our calculation in year one, we'll say proceeds, 600,000, base cost, 800,000. What does that create for us, guys? A 200,000 rands capital loss. Now, usually we want to go and put that into our capital loss column. Now we say, no, you're not allowed to do that because there's an unquantified amount. Okay, so in year two, now there's various different ways of doing it. In year two, you can now say, you can reperform it to say the proceeds is now 600,000, so from year one, plus the 100,000 from year two, so 700,000, and the base cost is still 800,000. So there's 100,000 rands here, that is a loss, and you say to yourself, there's still an unquantified amount. So again, paragraph 39a says that 100,000 rands we cannot claim. Now just at this point in time, let me just quickly explain to you. If you knew for a fact that you won't get the amount in year 3, then you can claim this 100,000 amount. That's part of the section. Okay, but assume for now we didn't. The other way of just doing it, guys, I just want to show you, is to carry forward that 200,000. It's to say in year 2, the proceeds is 100,000, and you bring that loss forward under paragraph 39A of 200,000 rands. That will also calculate 100,000 rands loss, the same 100,000 rands loss and it's, it's disallowed. So just different solutions will show you different ways of doing it. It's the principle that applies. Okay, year three then, an extra 400,000 rands. So in year three, the proceeds will be 600,000 plus 100,000 plus 400,000. So 1.1 million rands. And the base cost is 800,000 rands. So there's been a 300,000 rands capital gain and that amount is then taxed. So this is the idea that you don't claim capital losses in year one and year two and then eventually end up with a capital gain. They say wait until the transaction is done. But again, my comment, if in year two you knew for a fact, for example, that year three was not going to take place, then you could claim that 100,000 rands. So they basically just want you to finish the period. Right, so just in the act, 
Where a person during any year disposes of an asset and all the proceeds of that asset will not accrue to that person in that year, that person must, when determining the aggregate capital gain or aggregate capital loss, disregard any capital loss on the disposal. So if you make a gain, sure, then you can ta get taxed already. A person's capital loss, which is disregarded in any year, which has not otherwise been allowed, may be deducted from that person's capital gains in a subsequent year. Right. So that is what we did here when, we, when I said to you, you could also roll it forward. This, what we're doing here, does the same calculation. You could also roll it forward if in year one you had a 200, uh, or year one you had a 200,000 loss. So in year two, you say I've received another 100,000 rands, and I bring the loss forward. That is what that act describes there. So however you want to do it, it's the same thing. Three, if during any year of assessment, the person shows that no further proceeds will accrue to that person from the disposal, so much of the capital loss, which has been not been deducted, may be taken into account in a capital gain or capital loss calculation. So that is from my example where I said, if in year two, you knew for a fact that you're not going to receive anything else, that 100,000 rands loss will be allowed as a deduction.